Uh, thank you for that, Debbie. I really appreciate that. Um, I appreciate everybody coming during their lunchtime or happy hour, depending on what part of the world you are. And I want to share a little bit of some of the work we've done. Uh, if you know biosynthetic technologies, we are an innovation company. And what we're trying to do is deliver bio-based alternatives to petroleum. Our vision is to deliver innovative solutions towards that sustainable future. And of course, we wanna be uh, the premier global sustainable fluid supplier. Um, so before we, we get into sort of the hardcore technical aspects of it, everybody's been bantering around and I'm gonna have to redo my opening slide because I, I think there's 97 sustainability words on it. So I'll work on that. But what I did wanna do is share a little bit about our philosophy in sustainability. And we, we believe in circular sustainability, starting off with sustainable agriculture, got to have some sustainability from an economic perspective. perspective. And we always want to look at um, carbon absorption, carbon emissions, carbon footprint. So we start with the raw materials. How are they grown? What are you doing with them? We look at the manufacturing of the materials, the processing of the materials, and what the impact is. So what we like is that um, some, our, the majority of our products are sustainable, both from an environmental and a social perspective. We look at what are alternate uses of the land where the crops are being grown. Um, we want to have people and create jobs and give back to the community where we're working and using crops that are, are not really competing with food. Uh, when we look for a manufacturing facility, we wanna make sure that we're close to the fields so that we're not generating a lot of CO2, moving raw materials into the manufacturing facility. We try to produce our materials as sustainably as possible. So we're utilizing bent, uh, spent hulls to fire the, to fire the, uh, the, the boilers utilizing renewable energy wherever possible. And in our high level life cycle assessment, we, we determined that uh, for every metric ton of a BT product, the estolides we're making, we're absorbing about nine tons of CO2. Now that's at our gate. So depending on where the end, uh, the end customer is or where the product is going to end up, we'll, we'll probably have an impact on that. So we look at estolides as sort of the answer for sustainable lubricant, base stocks and additives. We have, this is a little bit old, we've got four core estolide products. And what we look for is what is their environmental characteristics? Of course, the majors are, the big three are, have always been the biodegradability, the ecotoxicity, and its propensity to bioaccumulate. These are mandated by a variety of different agencies and eco-labeling, uh, like the European eco-label, uh, the US EPA vessel general permit and others. But you also need to have um, performance. And when we look at bio-based materials, the weaknesses have always been around oxidative and hydrolytic stability. So we've looked to fix that in sort of our first generation products. And I'll, I'll share some about that in a little bit. And then of course, it's gotta be suit for purpose. If it's going into a piece of equipment, it's gotta meet you know, wear characteristics. It's gotta have extreme pressure protection. It's gotta be compatible with all the various components uh, in, the, uh, in the equipment that it's being operated in. Biodegradability is something that is a, is a little bit confusing for a couple of different reasons. Number one, there's, there, there's a lot of different test methodologies out there. Number two is uh, when you look at biodegradability, and this is a very simple reaction, starting with a lubricant on one end, you know, with carbon and hydrogens, adding an oxygen and microbes, breaking down it in its to component parts, um, which is normally CO2 in water. Um, if you're measuring the amount of the lubricant or the hydrocarbon that's going away, that is considered primary biodegradation. If you're looking at the evolution of the end products, uh, like the CO2 in water, that is 
uh, measuring the ultimate biodegradation. And that's much more common these days with the OECD 301 alphabet soup, ABCD, the ASTM uh, 5864. And normally you're looking for greater than 60% ultimate biodegradation. There are some newer CEC L33 type tests, the A93, which the goal is to be greater than 80%. Uh, the ASTM has some standards um, in terms of biodegradability, um, but what's more typically used are sort of the four different classifications. Starting with readily biodegradation, and that's utilizing ultimate degradability, the OECD 301B typically, which has got to be greater than 60% in 28 days. But once it begins degradation as defined by 10% biodegradation, you have a window of 10 days to reach that 60%. So when it biodegrades, it's got to biodegrade rapidly. Ultimately, which is different than ultimate degradation, but ultimately biodegradable is 60% within that 28 days without that 10 day window. Inherently biodegradable is somewhere between 20% and 60% in the 28 days. And then non-biodegradable is less than 28% in 28 days. And it's a shame that people are still using inherently biodegradable as an environmentally friendly, um, environmentally friendly benchmark. Um, so looking forward at ecotoxicity, uh, there's a variety of different methodologies, the ASTM 6046, there's a variety of OECD tests which depends on you know, what species you are, you are uh, ex uh, exposing to, to whatever it is you're testing. Uh, sort of the benchmark, the gold standard is uh, no visible effect of uh, greater than uh, 100 milligrams per milliliter or 100 ppm. And that's cl ca classified as non-toxic. So with that in mind, looking at sort of our core products, um, the estelides are meeting what I consider the gold standard for environmental performance uh, with all of the materials greater than 70% um, by the OECD, biodegradable by the OECD 301B as compared to the benchmark of 60%. Um, having high bio-based content um, ranging somewhere between greater than almost 70%. Now we have a, a new low pore pro product that is now 100% um, bio-based or bio-content. And, um, you know, sort of the benchmarks, de depending on what you're looking at, can be somewhere between 25 and 50% bio-based. We've done, do all of our testing at a thousand milligrams per, mil, uh, per liter, ecotoxicity, 10 times what the, the, uh, the benchmark is. We've done some testing at 10,000 parts per million. Um, but really you just see the species doing the backstroke in the, sub, in the material. So we found that to be not all that, not all that useful. All right, so that's sort of the, um, sort of the background in terms of environmental performance. What I really want to do now is focus on one of the traditional weaknesses of bio-based products, which are the pore points. And who doesn't love the polar bear you know, to, to uh, demonstrate sort of cold temperature performance. Um, but what we're trying to do is find ways to reduce the pore point and uh, make these estelides and make products um, more, more, more um, usable in some of the cold temperatures. And what we focused on was a couple of different materials. So looking at um, our BT4, uh, which is our low viscosity material. Um, and also comparing that to one of our newest products, which is our BT22 low pour. That's, a, that's a, an ISO 150, 22 centistoke. But what it does have is it has extremely good low temperature performance with its pour point at minus 37 uh, degrees. So, uh, we think that's that's a pretty good a pretty good pour point for this type of product. 
and we're actually able to improve upon that. So we're looking at a variety of different core point depressants uh, by chemical type. Uh, and what we've been able to find is that um, we can de definitely move the pore point on the BT4. The BT22, the BT75 are a little bit less um, resistant to the performance of virtually all different types of, uh, of pore point depressants. And what we've also found is that sometimes less pore point depressant, and I think we've known this in industry, but sometimes less is more. So looking at, say, the alkylated PMAs on BT4, you'll see that as you increase from 0.25% to 0.5%, uh, you actually are losing some of your cold temperature performance. We also did a variety of different materials. Now, what I've done for this presentation is we've tried to utilize genetic, generic additive systems. If you're interested in working with our Escalides and any of these materials throughout this presentation, please reach out to one of the BT team and we'll share with you what the, the actual materials are. We've worked with a variety of the additive suppliers and component suppliers. Um, and um, we, we're happy to share that on a one-to-one -one basis if there's a real interest. But we're, we're trying to make this sort of high-level technical uh, presentation so we're not really telling anybody how great these materials are or, or how terrible they are. So we could do that. We could do that more one-on-one. -on -one. And what we're looking at is, um, sort of in that top quadrant, we're looking at the BT4, uh, which is our low viscosity, four Senesoke at 100 product, ISO 22 material, which is very, very responsive to pore point depressants. So looking at uh, different types of, um, of, of uh, pore point or ad, uh, pore point depressants, the additives, we have a, a bi, it's targeted at, as, at, a, at, at, as a bio PMA, uh, we utilize the variety of the cold flow improvers that are traditionally used for diesel fuel and have been tinkering around with some of the biodiesel ones. You can see that the original poor point of the BT4 is a minus 21, and we're able to move that easily to become a, uh, to become a minus 36. Uh, what we also did is we created a low poor uh, BT4, um, which has by itself a minus, uh, poor point of um, minus 31, and we were able to improve that to a minus 41. Now, the low poor BT4 is not ready uh, for commercialization yet. It's in, it's in the works, so we've got that on the lab, but I thought I would put it into, uh, into some of these slides just to share some of the some of the knowledge we're, we're gaining and some of the work we're doing. Uh, what we also did was we put together a blend, which was a combination of 25% of our high viscosity SLI, the BT75, um, and 25%, wait, let's do that again. 75% of the BT4, which is the low viscosity SLI, 25% of the high viscosity SLI. Um, and by the way, these slides will be made available after, after the, the webinar, so you can go through that. And again, I'll, I'll provide the secret decoder ring uh, if there are some specific examples that you want to see. What we found, interestingly, was that um, in some cases um, that the, the blends really didn't have any positive benefit um, or that the, the blends were not negatively impacted by increasing uh, the amount of the high viscosity estylide, the BT75. So utilizing the blends, we were able to see in almost every case the, um, the, uh, the, an improvement in pore point by, by almost 10 degrees. Uh, but we found that once you got beyond uh, 0.1 or 0.2%, it had no further further benefits. 
And then looking at, so you're looking at sort of the blend, that second category. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor here, the second grouping. And then we looked at the BT22. And sadly, you know, we, it's, we call it research, right, for a reason. We really didn't have much of an impact on our standard BT22 with some of the uh, polymethacylate materials, but we were able to significantly improve our already stronger low pore BT22 by, by quite a few degrees, another seven degrees. So seven degrees on a cold day can make a bit of a difference. And then we also found in the blends, the diesel cold flu flow improver was able to improve the performance, the cold temperature performance of about 14 degrees. And again, um, moving from 0.5% to even up to 2% had no additional impact. We, we tried to combine different types of, of pore point depressants. Um, and uh, even on the blend, we, we saw some, some very significant positive impacts. So it's, I'm throwing a lot of, a lot of data at, at you all, all at one time. And, Hopefully you're all tracking and I'm not going too fast. And again, we're happy to sit down and share some of this information with you further on. So we did look at the impact of uh, some PMA, uh, which we've seen very, very effectively in our, our forced stenostoke, estelide, the BT4. Um, and you can see a starting point uh, poor point was minus 20, but what we found was minus 21. We found that increasing even a small amount, 1%, gave you a 10 degree drop in poor, um, and then increasing all the way up in a variety of different areas uh, did not have a positive impact any, any further than that. But what you did see was that the poor point depressants had a very significant impact on the kinematic visit at 40. So taking it from a, a 22, 22 all the way up to a 34, and also gave it a bit of a VI kick. So, so we see that as a potential opportunity for maybe a viscosity modifier, uh, which also gives you cold temperature performance. So something else we looked at, um, we're, we're focused on primarily um, base oils and additives, we're really not into the finished fluid basis, but during the pandemic lockdown, we started putting prototype products together, more to demonstrate, more to keep my research team active and busy, and, but also to help, help our customers understand how to formulate with these and to demonstrate the ability of the estelides to make really nice looking, um, really nice looking products whether it's hydraulic fluids, gear oils, engine oils, et cetera. Uh, by the way, we've just completed our GF6 uh, bio, bio, bio preferred engine oils. And if you want any information on that, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to brag on, on my team and their ability to, to get that, that achievement. Um, so in this case, we built an ISO 68, um, an ISO 68 uh, hydraulic fluid that was designed to meet the EPA vessel general permit. And what we tried to do was use a group three, four centisoak base oil. So as a 60-40 blend-ish, we used an off-the-shelf ad pack um, that was eco-label capable. We ran the biodegradability far exceeding the, the, the vessel general permit requirement of 60%, meeting 70%. Uh, we went just to make sure that it was not um, acutely toxic, so we did the 100 parts per million. Um, and we're able to get, get good performance. Um, you'll see that in terms of demulsibility and foam, which tend to be weaknesses of bio-based uh, lubricants, we had no problem passing that. You'll also see in the rust test, we had no problem passing that. Um, but what we also did is we went to some of my my good friends at Aguirre Marine, uh, manufacturers of uh, CERN tube seals. And uh, we, we took three different formulations and met the requirements uh, for their seal testing in, in all of those. So, so then we did further testing on that. Um, and you'll see that 
in, the, in sort of the lower bottom area, uh, we met hydrolytic stability hands down. We had excellent oxidative stability as measured by the RPVOT of greater than 1,000 minutes, 1,100 and 1,200. Um, one of the things about the estalides is even when you hit that 25.4 PSI drop, it doesn't reach that fall off the, the, the cliff um, and continues to give good oxidative stability. We also ran the Vickers vein pump test. So this is essentially a complete ISO uh, 15380 HES. Uh, well, I guess it's not quite HES because it has some of the, the group three, but it, it meets uh, it meets um, meets all the requirements. So here's here's what what came out. We were using a, a PMA, um, and we found that um, if you used the PMA on just the Group Three petroleum severely hydrotreated base stock, you're able to significantly, and that's what this material was designed for, was to significantly drop the pour point. But when you did a uh, a blend of the group three with the estalide, it didn't have any positive impact. So, you know, again, we call it research. Um, minus 25 might be, be good enough uh, for, for some applications, but um, we call that a, a strike at the old home plate, right? You can't, you can't hit the ball if you don't swing the bat. So, um, so we're, uh, but we were able to, to move forward on that. One of the things we did was we, um, we wanted to look at um, some BT4 and, and, and utilize, uh, look at this in terms of a, um, in terms of a fully formulated product. Uh, we used a, an eco-label ad pack off the shelf. We looked at a conventional viscosity modifier. And again, looking at the, the viscosities, we're able to uh, of both of an ISO 46 and the ISO 100 by utilizing the right combination of pore point depression, ad pack, and viscosity modifier, we were able to see achieve some of our target uh, low temperature performances. One of the other things we were able to do was we were putting together a food grade hydraulic fluid uh, we were working with our friends at the uh, United Soybean Board, so thanks to them, they helped us. We put together two different groups of materials. One was a straight hyaluronic soy vegetable oil with an estalide blend. And then we also looked at the, the uh, hyaluronic soy derived estalides uh, with the estalides. And looking at those, um, we were able to improve the performance of all of them by a couple of degrees. So the starting point, poor point, we're in the minus 20 range. And as we move forward with the right uh, viscosity modifiers, uh, and this was done with a, uh, the, whole, the whole package was done with, a, with food grade products. We're able to, to have a, a positive benefit um, and gave it better low temperature performance and made it easier to blend. Um, so one of the things we did was we looked at um, uh, the estalide and the vegetable-based product as compared to a mineral oil and a polyalpha olefin derived material. And we're able to show that, um, that the vegetable-based and the bio-based materials were able to be every bit as uh, competitive and work every bit as well as those derived on mineral oils. And, uh, and PAO blends. One of the other things we had, we had derived from oleic acid, um, a low viscosity estalide. Uh, so we call that BT4O or OBT4. Again, this is a research material. We're not, not ready for prime time and we're not ready to make it commercially. Uh, and we're not even sure how we're gonna do this in a cost-effective manner. Uh, but it's pretty exciting when you're coming out with a unadditized bio, 100% bio-based material that has good oxidative stability, good hydrolytic stability, and offers a, uh, a minus 50 pour. So that's, 
that's intriguing to me. And, you know, kudos to, to our, the, the BTR and D team who are, who are just phenomenal folks and hard partying people. So uh, high five to all of them. And then looking at um, if we could improve the performance of that by using a sort of an off the shelf uh, PMA pore point depressant, we're able to actually increase that into the minus 60, mix, minus 60 range. So that's, that's pretty exciting. And um, we're trying to figure out why sort of all the BT4s, our conventional BT4, our low pore BT4, and the oleic derived BT4s all respond really nicely with, with uh, pore point depressants. So that sort of rounds out what we're doing on, on cold flow improvement. Um, what I wanna now do is talk about oxidation inhibition, right? That's always a weakness of bioproducts. The estylides have been developed uh, to offer best in class oxidative stability as compared to anything. Um, and I'll share some of that information. We, do, we are looking at variety of antioxidants, primary, secondary, tertiary ox, antioxidants. Again, everything we utilize is off the shelf chemistry. We had a lot of really nice support from a lot of uh, material suppliers and I'll, I'll, I'll share some of those folks at the end of the conversation. One thing I wanna share is um, we, we sometimes utilize the RPVOT. Um, we also look at the RSSOT um, because we think that you know, it, it uses smaller samples and especially when you're doing bench testing, a small sample is, is worth its weight in gold, literally. Um, it's a quick test, uh, it's inexpensive. And we've been working on developing a positive correlation between the RSSOT and the RPVOT if anybody has that information or has any other additional information, we'd love to do a collaboration. Uh, but what we found so far is that when you operate at about 160 degrees, which is this lower chart, you're getting an R squared of nine point, some big number, 9.6, uh, 9.8. And um, we think that's, that's a pretty good indicator. We do see directionality, so so we're we, you know we're doing some work with RPVOT, we're doing some with the RSSOT, and and I'll make sure that I specify uh, which tests we did. So if I don't call me, you're you're free to call me out or ping us on the chat. Um, one thing we've done and we've shared this before is we have sort of an in-house uh, baseline, which is 0.5% phenolic, 0.5% aminic antioxidants. And what we did was we tested sort of all the different types of base oils out there, including the estylides. And what you'll see is on the left side of the bar chart, um, we're getting a thousand minutes, greater than a thousand minutes. Um, you'll see that compares very well with the low, low viscosity group threes and low viscosity PAOs. You'll see some of the other types of esters don't do so well in the, um, in the uh, oxidative stability range. And uh, even the high viscosity PAOs didn't, didn't do so well. So we're kind of excited about that. Um, so a newer product for us is our BT22 LP, which is a low pore uh, 22 uh, ISO 150 type of product. Uh, some of our customers came to us and said, hey, you know, we love the BT22, but sometimes we work in Canada in the winter time, we need to go uh, and operate in lower temperatures. We all know traditionally that, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a trade off between saturation, oxidative stability, cold flow. Um, and what we were able to do was by, by partially saturating uh, the, the, the molecule, we we're able to improve the performance of the product, but it, it at not, not surprisingly, it reduced the, uh, the oxidative stability as measured by the RPVOT down from you know, pretty high numbers to 30 or 40, which makes it look much more like an unsaturated vegetable oil. So what we, we, want, we set out to do was to go out and um, go out and look at a variety of different antioxidants to see if we can get uh, this product um, back up to sort of the oxidative stability that we're looking for. So we used a variety of different 
uh, different types of chemicals um, and uh, from a variety of different uh, uh, component suppliers. And we did kind of an exhaustive uh, study uh, in terms of their ability to improve their oxidative stability. Um, and what we found was it, it, covered, it covered the spectrum um, from having minimal impact to having some, some pretty good impact. So this is just the straight uh, BT22 LP adding certain amounts of, of um, certain amounts of, of uh, inhibitor. And um, we saw that two of them actually had significant movement in terms of, uh, in terms of improving uh, the oxidative stability. Much to my surprise, uh, so we had one that was almost 400 minutes and one that was a little over 200 minutes. Uh, they were both primary inhibitors. Uh, one was an aminic and one was phenolic. Um, so so that, that said some, some interesting things to us. But what it, what it shows me is that by using the low pore with that's partially unsaturated, we can get the oxidative stability well into the range where a lot of the conventional off-the-shelf biohydraulic fluids are having their, their environmental or their, their oxidative stability. The other thing we found was that utilizing uh, different inhibitors, um, it actually changed the pressure differential curves. So you'll see the red line here in this chart on the, on the right hits the 22 uh, 25.4 PSI drop and then drops off precipitously, but utilizing another material, um, it, it draws out the oxidative stability for a much longer time uh, and thereby potentially in, increasing the useful life of the, of the formulated product. The other thing we learned, and again, it's not surprising, but sometimes less is more, and utilizing two different inhibitors, uh, we found that in some cases, um, you know, zero to 0.5% had no positive benefit. At 1%, it jumped up to what we considered a usable level. Um, but then moving forward, it dropped off precipitously back to the same levels that, um, that showed with, with no inhibitor. We also found that uh, combining uh, different inhibitors with aminic and phenolics um, in, in many of these cases really didn't have a significant impact. They were able to move the bar a little bit, but looking at even 1% of the combination, 1.5% of the combination, we never got over 100 parts. So, um, so it didn't, or 100 minutes. So you know, at 100 minutes, it's a nice material, but, but really not what we were shooting for. Sometimes it takes, three different components. And what we're able to do with this case was we did three different inhibitor components at various treat rates. And we we're again able to take the LP, uh, the BT22 LP, and reach what we considered the usable levels of almost or even exceeding the 300 minutes uh, by the RPVOT. And then we, we chose to take a look at the PDSC and we're able to have some improvement on those as well. So, um, so we think that it takes a lot, of, a lot of balancing and working with the various types of inhibitors to get the levels that you're looking for. Uh, we also looked at, went back and looked at BT22, which is the fully saturated estalide. And again, no matter what inhibitor package you put into, you know, we looked at one, two, three, four, five. Um, uh, where they were all able to reach greater than a thousand minutes, greater than twelve hundred minutes. Um, where without any inhibitor, you know, we we're still only getting sort of the the lower levels. So looking at again, not surprisingly, um, it has uh, it has a, a lot of benefit and a lot of response to antioxidants. 
moving forward, we know that a lot of a lot of um, a lot of the bio-based products are are canola derived, and we wanted to see how how utilizing esters and how utilizing inhibitors would affect a a high performance or a well formulated uh, canola uh, hydraulic fluid. Uh, we utilized the high oleic canola, one, because it was, we had some in the lab, and two, because we wanted to raise the bar. Um, and because uh, the high oleic canola is going to do, going to be going to be better than, than, you know, sort of the RBD canolas. So what we did is we put together a very basic, um, a very basic uh, hydraulic fluid, again, using an off-the-shelf commercially available ad pack, uh, utilizing a viscosity modifier to sort of focus in on the right viscosity materials. We, so we did 100% of the high, or you know, 96.25%, but 100% of the base oil as canola oil. Then we did a 50-50 blend between the estelide and the canola oil. And then we did 100% estelide um, with an 80, 80, 10, 85, 12 mixture of the low viscosity and the high viscosity. Everything else was kept the same. So the results look, uh, look pretty similar from the physical properties, right? We were targeting an ISO 46. Um, our, our, our blends were a little high, but since, uh, since we weren't commercializing these materials and we didn't think that a couple of centistokes here and there was going to have a, a major impact, on the um, on on the performance of it, uh, what we found though was that when looking at straight canola oil, uh, which has you know moderate pore point of minus minus twenty, utilizing the multifunctional ad pack, we were able to and the right viscosity modifier, we were able to improve the performance from the cold temperature performance by roughly ten degrees. We found the same thing with the 50-50 split with the estelide and the vegetable oil. And then finally, with the 100% estelide, you may lose a point or two, or maybe that's the error of the test. Um, but everything else looked, looked pretty well, uh, looked pretty good and, and pretty similar. If we were to do this again, we might, we might tweak the, the Kinmanic Vis at 40 to be more, uh, be more uh, closer to 46. But uh, for, for this purpose, it was fine. So here's where, here's where it gets fun. Um, looking at, at least to me anyway, um, but I have a very low amusement level. Um, so looking at straight canola oil, and this is the high oleic, we, we, and this is we use the, the RSSOT, the Rapid Small Scale Oxidation Test, which is the ASTM 7545. This was done at 140 C and the 700 kilopascals. Um, what we're able to do is take that 46, and then by utilizing the off-the-shelf multifunctional ad pack, it bumped it up to 120 minutes. Um, and then when we were able, to, which is you know, good for light duty hydraulic applications, I guess. Um, actually, I made a career doing exactly that. So, so yeah, that's okay. And then we did a, a vegetable est estelide blend and we we're able to almost triple, get up to 300 minutes in the, in the RSSOT. Um, and then once again, we're able to almost triple it again from almost 300 to almost 800. And for those of us who are visual, this is kind of what, uh, what it looks like on the bar graph, showing it, the improvement in terms of the, uh, the oxidative uh, stability. Uh, so that, that's kind of, uh, kind of the oxidative stability study we did. Um, but you know, in spirit of, of Halloween, I did want to share something that uh, that you know the myths and legends, and we we, we looked at uh, petroleum oils and bio oils, and I hear all the time, well, bio oils are incompatible with petroleum products. And what I wanted to do is demonstrate some of the work we did on that. So we started with a off-the-shelf petroleum hydraulic fluid uh, from a major multinational significant brand, um, and then we took our um, prototyped bio-based hydraulic fluid, and we compared them side by side. And you know they're both good uh, ISO 46 viscous, uh, ISO 46 hydraulic fluids. You see that not surprisingly, 
the uh, the estalide had a little slightly higher um, higher viscosity index, but uh, but yeah, slightly more. Uh, the petroleum one, as promised, was not readily or ultimately biodegradable. The bio base one was. Um, and then what we did was we we did blends. We took 100% of the estalide. We took 100% of the petroleum, and then we did a 50-50 blend. And uh, these are fully formulated materials. We did a 50-50 blend. We did a 10 mineral, 90 estalide, a 90 mineral, 10 estalide, and we wanted to do compatibility studies. And uh, we put them together at room temperature. Um, man, they all look pretty clear. You'll see that the the petroleum is is much more water white. The estalides have that honey amber material, have that honey amber color, but there's no separation. Um, somehow these got on a timer, but but you'll be bear with me because um, it's almost right there. Um, and then we had a room temperature evaluation of the of the blends at at one week, and they all they all look pretty good. Not surprisingly, there's no precipitate, there's no hazing. There's no incompatibility. And then what we wanted to do is we wanted to do low temperature storage. So we took it down to minus 21. And you can see that the materials tend to thicken, but they're still flowing. And again, there's, you know, I, I think there's a, it looks a little hazy, but it's really more condensation than, the, than anything else. So there's no precipitation, there's no sediment after 24 hours. And then after five days, 120 hours, still at the 21 minus 21, everything looks looks clean and 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 solubilized. So we're not seeing any degradation there. Um, we ran it a couple more days, so um, so we took uh, we left it to um, seven days, you know, one week, and again, everything is still flowing. There was no onset of any type of incompatibility or any onset of, of thickening um, characteristics. So in conclusion, the oils were clear, miscible, the fluid flowed under low temperature performance, the mineral oils and, and bio oils were compatible with one another and, and don't indicate any separation or changes. Um, so in, in all the cases, the biohydraulic fluids fared equal to or better than the petroleum when it came to the low, ter low, 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 low temperature storage stability. So, um, so I want to thank all these wonderful people without whom uh, this could not have been done. Um, Alex and Snigda, who are part of our, and Travis, who are part of our R&D team, uh, were instrumental in gathering the data and creating the vision. Uh, Debbie Neubauer uh, was instrumental in kicking my butt to make me put this presentation together and get this webinar organized and bring all you nice people in for, for a wonderful lunch. And these variety of additive and component manufacturers were really, very, really, very helpful um, for, all, for all the work they did uh, at supplying materials and in-house testing. So this has been a great project. And um, we like to be connected. So come find us um, on LinkedIn, in Twitter, on our website, uh, our blog. Here's my, my contacts. Um, that number reaches my cell phone, which is never outside arm's reach. So give me a shout. Um, and I think we have a few minutes for questions. And Debbie, you're on mute. I realize that. <laughs> we do have a couple of minutes for questions. We have some uh, private questions that were posted and we'll answer those separately. Um, the latest was a question on how does the partial hydrogenation to get saturated estalites impact biodegradability and pull point or cold temperature performance? Ah, that is that's a great question. Um, and you know, partial partial separ um, saturation will improve the cold temperature performance, but it has that inverse relationship with the oxidative stability. So while you're gaining cold temperature performance you're losing the oxidative stability. We have not found any impact, however, on the hydrolytic stability. So it's still uh, nicely oxidatively stable, um, but you're, you're, you're giving some of the oxidative stability away. 
until you start using the right antioxidant combinations where you can gain part of that oxidative stability back. All right. Um, I did not see any other questions, but if you have some, uh, you saw Mark's email address. It's mmiller at biosynthetic.com. Feel free to email him day and night with any questions you may have. <laughs> Thank you for that, Debbie. You're welcome. Uh, you can also find us online, of course, if you go to LinkedIn, how you found this uh, webinar, you can get all the information that you want from us there and reach out to us there and we will answer any questions you may have. Other than that, um, thank you so much for attending today. We appreciate you spending time with us and um, have a great day.